we're in the driver's seat influencing whether we're living our best lives or not. It's an extraordinarily empowering time in science. It really is empowering, this notion that every organism's interaction with their environment can be adaptive or maladaptive, and we have a tremendous amount of control over those interactions. Welcome to Commune. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, and bring the world closer together. Okay, here we go. Dr. Kara Fitzgerald, welcome back to the Commune Podcast. Yeah, it is absolutely great to be with you today, Jeff. Yeah, I am so sorry I cannot behold you in, in three dimensions as I look and see the Topanga backdrop behind <laughs> you. It, it, it breaks my heart not to be there. Yeah, we um, miss you for sure. <laughs> so we last chatted in the spring of this year, just to timestamp uh, this particular conversation. We're in September 2022. So we spoke right around the release of your book, um, Younger You. And that particular episode was one of the most downloaded episodes in the history of the podcast. Um, and, uh, um, and I've interviewed some movie stars, so you're up there amongst the celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the work that you're doing is, is 100% sort of in the zeitgeist. And so I, I'm thrilled to, to be able to, to talk to you again today and follow up on, um, on that discussion and also obviously to be making um, uh, the course with you on, on the topics that you explore um, in your book. So just a, a note for people listening in, um, while this conversation itself will be completely uh, digestible on its own, I, I do encourage people to tune into the original episode that was released, I believe, on May 19th, 2022, because in that episode, we do lay some of the groundwork for some of the terminology that we'll be poking at today, um, concepts like the difference between like chronological age orbits around the sun and biological age uh, and how you can test for your bio age. Uh, we also explored the delineation between health span and lifespan and uh, the importance not just of living a long time, but actually living a healthy, thriving life, not only to reduce suffering for yourself, but the suffering of your family members and to reduce uh, the societal expense. And as you point out so articulately in your book, you know, the vast majority of Americans are spending the last 16 years of their life uh, with multiple comorbidities. Um, and, uh, and that's just contributing to a lot of suffering. So, um, so I encourage people to, to go back and to listen to that episode. I mean, today I would love to focus in on a concept that can uh, reverse this descent into illness. Um, and you first introduced me to a concept that has been echoed in almost every single conversation I've had since our last conversation by many of your colleagues, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bland, who was just up in Topanga, uh, Mark Hyman, of course, um, this concept of epinutrition. Now, Hippocrates, I, I believe, lived somewhere around the time of 400, 440 BC, uh, who said, let food, let food be thy medicine. So obviously, you didn't come up with the concept uh, of food as medicine. And I know that you were a, a student of Linus Pauling, who um, was a pioneer in orthomolecular medicine. Um, but you are at the tip of the spear um, pioneering this, the next level, the genomic level of nutrition. And this is so exciting. Um, so per, potentially as a pathway into spreading greater understanding around this notion of epinutrition, we can go back and do a little scaffolding and some definitional work, some basic biology. Um, so epinutrition is obviously referring to the epigenome. So 
potentially, could you walk us through what is the genome and what is the epigenome and what's the difference between the two? Yes. And as always, Jeff, you have permission to interrupt me at any time on this journey and get me to clarify or pull me out of the rabbit hole. Whatever you need to do is, is, is fine by me. Um, let me just say that we, I, I love to just give a little bit of background because I think it provides context. We um, mapped the human genome in the early 2000s, and we really anticipated that it would be a Rosetta Stone providing us with guidance around what causes chronic diseases. Gene X causes heart disease, gene Y causes diabetes. We really thought that the genome mapping and completing that massive, massive, extraordinary undertaking would provide us with some serious answers. What we realized actually rapidly was that, in fact, it was infinitely more complex, that it wasn't one gene, one disease, uh, as we had anticipated, or a couple of genes causing a couple, you know, causing heart disease, something, something simplistic. So we, we kind of put the genome aside, if you will. I, I mean, that's a little crass, but um, it ushered us into the era of epigen epigenetics. And that is how is the DNA regulated? So if we think of DNA as inert hardware, we need the operating system. We need the software of the epigenome to dictate what genes are on and what genes are off. Um, and that is, there's different, different biochemical marks that will tag the genes that will influence how genes are folded, how they open up to be transcribed, et cetera, et cetera. Just a bunch of different comp you know, complex processes. I mean, as simple as the genome turned out to be is as, as complex as the epigenome is. Um, and it's there that we have really dove in, you know, with, with our whole being and we're, you know, I'm studying it. And as you mentioned before, you know, all of my, my colleagues have really turned their attention to epigenetics. So it's what turns genes on and what turns genes off. And this is where environment, this is where us, how we live our lives meets the genome. Like we're you know, we're in the driver's seat influencing whether we're living our best lives or not, influencing what genes are on. Do we have good guy genes on or do we have pro-inflammatory sort of disease promoting genes on, et cetera, et cetera. So it's an extraordinarily empowering time in science that we have this piece of information and that we can see this and we can see the influence of our lifestyle inputs on gene expression. It's really extraordinary. Yeah, it, it really is empowering this notion that <clears throat> every organism's interaction with their environment can be adaptive or maladaptive, and we have a tremendous amount of control over those interactions. Not full control. We not, don't necessarily know what airborne glyphosate there is, or we don't always have control over what toxic chemicals are in the air at all times. Maybe we don't know what phthalates and parabens are in particular, health and beauty aid products, et cetera. We can obviously do our very, very best to educate ourselves, um, but we do have a tremendous amount of agency. And I think that this is what this kind of last 20 years of emerging science is beginning to show us, which is so exciting, this post, uh, you know, Human Genome Project, is that there's all of these fields like neuroplasticity, microbiome, epigenetics, that are all about interactivity with our environment, and um, and that's a place where you know we can put our thumb on the scale a little bit. So, um, come on, let me tease this out a tiny bit because while I've tried to build a fluency in my own self and among my audience, I'm not a doctor and very few of, of my listeners are doctors. So, you know, the, the DNA um, provides some sort of blueprint for the coding of certain, mostly proteins. Um, and, and proteins, a, a, lot of, a lot of people associate protein with, you know, muscle building, for example, but proteins are everywhere. They're in hormones and neurotransmitters and, and enzymes, et cetera. So, um, and this is really how we function. But those blueprints that are encoded in that genome can be 
expressed differently. They can essentially be turned on and off. That's a little simplistic, but they can be turned on and off. And th- and that is kind of where the epigenome comes into play. Is that a, a fair uh, yeah, understanding? Yeah, it is. And I think it's important that you say we can put our thumb on the scale, um, but not completely. Like, And let me just give you an yeah. example, because that is what you say is an important. Um, so we have the same DNA, you know, in every DNA containing cell in the body, you know, so, so, right. so other than red blood cells, cells without nuclei. DNA is every, it's the exact same stuff. So why is your hair cell not just like your heart or your liver or your teeth, right? The cells are different because of epigenetic imprints. Um, what is What genes are turned on in that cell, what genes are inhibited in that cell. And we're not changing that. Like in no time soon will your retinal cell turn into a neuron, you know, into a, or into a, mm-hmm. into a hair. <laughs> you know we're not, not. Cha- we're not we're not we're not changing that anytime. <laughs> Although, yeah, right. Everything seems to be turning into a hair now as in my fifties. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So maybe there, <laughs> so there, maybe there is a little bit of weakening in your in your yeah, right. epigenome in that way. But for really for the most part, your cells are going to stay the cell type that you know that they are. There's not going to be any shifting. So, however, on that continuum, there's plenty of of. Um, changeable, you know, more malleable epigenetic marks. And that's where we're sitting in the driver's seat. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So that, that actually brings up a more general biological question that um, came to mind when, when I was doing some research um, to, for this discussion, which is, so we have these pluripotent stem cells kind of that can essentially form a a retinal cell or a hepatocyte or essentially any cell in the body at at some point. And is the differentiation of these cells impacted by this process of methylation? And this could be kind of our, our, our gateway into this concept of methylation in general. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's fundamentally about methylation. So you've got these pluripotent stem cells. I mean, the process of you know, the egg becoming fertilized, you, you're, you're removing mom and dad's methylation marks on their DNA, most of them, but mm. not all. And we can circle back to what happens with those remaining. And then we, we new methylation marks. So everything is scrubbed clean in a process called demethylation during embryogenesis. And then new methylation marks are, you know, actively laid down. And that dictates the fate of those pluripotent stem cells. That's exactly right. And that should give us an idea that, you know, that moment, you know, pregnancy, embryogenesis and beyond, the, pro- the journey of pregnancy is wildly active with epigenetic activity, extraordinarily just. Mm. Yeah. And then hopefully from there on in, a liver cell stay, replicates another liver cell or a breast cell replicates another breast cell and that, that does so in an orderly fashion. And sometimes it doesn't do that and it becomes dysfunctional and tumors begin to grow. And then you have a phenomenon known as cancer, which is a, is a sort of tricky thing to actually fully encompass. Well, you know what? Um, you could actually, you can have these benign tumors, teratomas. I'm sure some people mm-hmm. have had them in your audience or you know what they are. And there's the, there are these little sac collections of like s- cells that didn't fully materialize correctly. So maybe there's, you know, some partial, some teeth in there, or a little bit of hair and, or some other debris. And those haven't been appropriately methylated. And they can accumulate and create these teratomas, which are, are benign, and they can be removed. They can be problematic, just, I think, structurally. But um, so that would be on the benign end and things. But yes, of course, cancer uh, would be the other spectrum. And we can circle back and talk to that, about that. Yeah. So we have this DNA that is consilient across all of our cells, and then it becomes methylated in a particular way, and these cells become differentiated, et cetera. And then can you describe the mechanism of methylation or hypermethylation? What is that mechanism? Yeah, absolutely. And let me just say, in case any scientist is listening, uh, there are many epigenetic marks. <laughs> There's a lot of them. Okay. It's it, but methylation is 
one of the most important for a handful of reasons in part of what we're, what we're talking about now in, in cell differentiation. So, but I do want to acknowledge there's a lot going on. Um, so a methyl group, those of us, you know, just going back to high school chemistry, it's a carbon and three hydrogens. And we create, it's just a simple, simple molecule, you know, just ubiquitous in the body, ubiquitous in nature, very, you know, easy to use, easy to make. We are using methyl groups. We are placing methyl groups onto compounds. We are removing methyl groups onto compounds in every cell of the body all of the time. One place we rely on methylation to change the behavior of, 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 of a structure is DNA. Um, the methylation cycle, which produces this carbon and three hydrogens, um, is very nutrient dense. Uh, and we're going to talk more about that, but it's just the, there's a lot of nutrients involved in creating the compound. It's called S adenosyl methionine that carries that little carbon and three hydrogens that places it then on DNA. It's called S adenosyl methionine. It's an energy dependent, sort of very active cycle, nutri nutrient dense. And then on the DNA itself, there's an enzyme, a family of enzymes called DNA methyltransferases. And as the enzyme name implies, it transfers the methyl group from the S adenosyl methionine onto cytosine, uh, which is a DNA base. And when that cytosine is methylated, when the when it, when the promoter region, so the gene, it's a, so the area of the gene that can be transcribed that can make the protein that you mentioned earlier, when the cytosines in that promoter region are heavily methylated. And in science, we often denote these methyl groups as red lollipops. So if you can picture a strand of DNA in your mind, it's dotted, one of these little regions is dotted with these red lollipops. It blocks the transcription process from occurring, just structurally it inhibits anything from landing in there. Um, so a lot of methyl groups on the promoter region of the DNA is going to inhibit it from being turned on. Conversely, if there's an absence, if there's an inhibition of methyl groups, and let me actually just back up and say when there's a lot of red lollipops, that's called hypermethylation. If there's an absence or just few red lollipops, that's called hypomethylation. When there are few, that gene may be transcribed. That gene can be turned on. Right. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, so essentially, hypermethylation is really almost structure, creating a structural blockage yeah, yeah, that's exactly for right. the transcription or the coding of certain proteins that are, that are, that can be good or bad. Um, and it, so what we want to do is find kind of optimal methylation balance. Is that correct? So certain genes express themselves at the right times and other times genes are turning off at the right times. Yes. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So we, you know, our goal would be to have the optimal genes for wellness to be turned on, the optimal genes for health to be on, and the problem genes to be inhibited. Right. So then you get into the like, well, why is this important? Well, there are genes, for example, that code for tumor suppression, right? There are other genes that code for neurotransmitters like serotonin, which is the feel-good neurotransmitter. There's other genes that code for uh, BDNF that, that improves cognitive function. So ha <laughs> um, turning on certain gene expression is central to health. And it turns out that this process of methylation is very sensitive to what we actually consume uh, in, in our diets and a whole bunch of other lifestyle inputs. But, um, but diet seems to be kind of chief amongst the inputs that can influence this methylation process. Is that right? Yeah. Just, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the methylation cycle, our ability to make the compound S adenosyl methionine, you know, that's just whirring around in the body, like all of the time. I mean, think of oxygen, you know, for breathing. I mean, we just need it everywhere all of the time. 
it's like that. I mean, we don't feel methylation happening, but if it's <laughs> if it stops, we stop. You know, it's that fundamental. It's everywhere all of the time. And it's extremely nutrient demanding. It's very nutrient demanding to make the S adenosyl methionine. So that's one way in which what we eat is going to have is going to impact what's happening with us. There's, you know, there's there's a handful of different ways that we'll that we'll talk about, but that's one way. So we need those methyl donors. Um, we need to be able to place those red lollipops down on the DNA. Right. So now we've established some basic biology and some basic mechanism here. Now let's circle back to the the elephant in the room, this notion of epinutrition. So, okay, so now we know that genes can be expressed in different ways and that they're influenced by the epigenome and the epigenome is highly influenced by food and other environmental inputs. So, okay, now let's talk about epinutrition. So from without getting into specific foods, because we will go there, are there primary groups of food or nutrition genres that support healthy methylation patterns? Yeah. You know, I would say plants are really kind of the rock stars. They're not the only part of the equation, um, but they are, you know, they're just big players in the world of methylation for a variety of rather extraordinary reasons. I mean, we need adequate protein, you know, we need good fat, um, but plants are extraordinary. Plants, yeah. mushrooms, I mean, yeah. And are these categorized as, in the book you talk about methyl donors. Um, can you expound upon that uh, a little bit? What are the nutrients that actually make up these methyl groups? Sure. The way that we, so methyl donors are the nutrients required for that methylation cycle to be worrying, for us to be able to have that compound S adenosyl methionine that will donate that little methyl group. The nutrients needed are um, folate is massive, B12, um, something called choline, uh, commonly found in eggs. Beets uh, include a nutrient called betaine. Also mm. magnesium, potassium, zinc, amino acids like cysteine, uh, DHA from fish helps to regulate the enzymes in this methylation cycle. Um, B1, B2, so thiamine, riboflavin, even niacin. Um, there's just, and biotin. Biotin's another B vitamin uh, that we could make in our gut. Actually, a number of these nutrients we can make in our gut, which we can talk about also. Uh, but those are just some of the nutrients that we need to keep that methylation cycle going, to put red lollipops down. Now, it's more involved than that. We're doing more than just placing red lollipops. As you mentioned before, we want to balance. But those are the first group of nutrients for us to actually, you know, ha create methylation, allow methylation to happen. Got it. So when we're talking about getting adequate folate or B9 or B12, for example, or, um, is it just enough to supplement with a B complex or are we really looking to, uh, to focus our diet so we're getting kind of exogenous diet that that we're eating within a matrix essentially to yes. make um, those nutrients more uh, effective. Yeah, I think that you're right. I think the whole food matrix is essential. I we need to supplement sometimes. We need these synthetic nutrients. We need, you know, folate, uh, B12, et cetera, in a capsule. Some people require super physiologic amounts for a period of time. But now that we're in the era of omics, you know, this revolution where we can see gene expression in this incredibly sophisticated way, we see the power of our interventions. And I think that there's some suggestion in the literature that supplementing can be too much, can actually push forward. Isolated high-dose nutrients can actually push forward um, problems that... Uh, 
that we don't want to have that can prompt imbalances in gene expression, um, that maybe too many of those red lollipops, too much methylation could happen, that we could in fact inhibit genes that we want on, protective genes. So if we overdo this high dose isolated nutrition, we could wreak havoc under some conditions. Now as a physician, as a functional medicine doctor, I'm prescribing B vitamins all the time. But since I've moved into studying this, I am definitely more nuanced. I go lower dose and I absolutely 100% lean on food first. So to your point, there is a extraordinarily complex collection of nutrients. So these methyl donors are, you know, form, are found in abundance in green veggies and, and mushrooms. Those are two classic, fabulously plant-based methyl donor foods. But they also have hundreds of other compounds uh, that we call methylation adaptogens. So un again, an epinutrient. But these, these compounds, they don't have any role in making the red lollipops, putting the methyl donors out, down on the DNA, but it appears like they direct where it happens. Um, mm. and, they, and, it, and it appears that they help optimize where it's happening. And I just, I think that's extraordinarily interesting. And so it's a no brainer that we always want our, our methyl donors, we want our methyl nutrients, these epinutrients together. So we have methyl donors on one side and, uh, and then on the other side, in order to upregulate the efficiency of these methyl donors, um, we have adaptogens and polyphenols, right? So can you, can you, um, kind of pull on that a tiny bit and, and give us some examples of key, uh, adaptogens and other kinds of phytochemicals that seem to, uh, have a positive impact on the methylation process? Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. So, um, Polyphenols are methylation adaptogens. That, the, that was a term coined by a good friend of mine, Michael Stone, uh, and a, a functional medicine doc on faculty at the IFM. And I was talking to him about this concept. I was talking to him about what I was reading in the literature with this great excitement. You know, we consume methyl donors in our diet and these polyphenols actually appear to direct where they go and what happens. And he said, oh, methylation adaptogens. And I said, that's it, Michael, let's just, we'll use that term. <laughs> but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we have, we've used it, but I, I like epinutrients just as a general category. It's like, like a preference of mine. They're all working epigenetically. Um, polyphenols, you know, the colors in our veggies, you know, the, the pigments, the, uh, the blue and berries. So um, classic, classic epinutrients, uh, methylation adaptogens would be the catechins in green tea, in particular EGCG. So why are we drinking our green tea? You know, the, 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 the wonderment of green tea, it's anti-inflammatory, it's anti-cancer, it's antioxidant. Um, it's, it's because of these, this green, this EGCG and the other catechins, and my guess is, you know, we'll see if I'm proven correct or not. My guess is all these downstream powerful effects of EGCG and that cup of green tea have to do with its potent ability to regulate gene expression, to influence gene expression. So that's one. Hmm. Um, curcumin, really important. And by the way, both of these, these two nutrients that I've, I've just mentioned, to, Curcumin is in turmeric, so if you've had yourself a delicious curry or a nice mug of golden milk, you've just had a good dose of, of, of curcumin. Um, both of these are time immemorial nutrients. They've got, you know, millennia long use histories. We've known, you know, for thousands of years that these are important players. And so now in this era where we can see gene expression, we can actually measure gene expression, I think we're beginning to see why. They both regulate what genes are turning on and what genes are turning off. It's amazing. So those are just two compounds. I can go on, but let me stop there and, and hear what you have to say. Yeah, well, so this is this is really where the rubber hits the road for me and, and it gets pretty geeky, but super exciting. <laughs> yeah. And one of my favorite sections of the book is, uh, so uh, there, there's an extensive um, uh, PDF associated with the book on on Audible, which is where I like to listen to it often. But there is uh, this one section which I've printed out here that I find just to be incredible because this is really where you know you've untangled a lot of the science and started to like literally connect the dots between 
particular nutrients and um, and nutrient responsive genes. So let's just hover for a second around the the BRCA genes, for example. So um, BRCA became famous, really, I think, in 2013 when uh, Angelina Jolie chose to have elective prophylactic double mastectomy because she had the BRCA mutation. So I want to just delineate between the BRCA mutation and the BRCA gene itself, because as I think you know, you point out, the BRCA gene, BRCA1 and BRCA2, are actually tumor suppressors, not to be confused with the BRCA mutation. But we can talk about Angelina Jolie at some point if we want to, too, but, <laughs> um, and, and, and where you stand on that, because it's not unrelated, um, because you know, part of this discussion is around are we, um, you know, is uh, how beholden are we to our genetic determinism? Um, and in some cases, there's probably, yes, it, to some degree, it exists on a, on a continuum. But I want to get to this f- first before we um, uh, talk about Angelina Jolie, <laughs> if we ever do. So the, the BRCA gene um, is a tumor suppressor gene that also repairs DNA and regulates estrogen production. So um, now the BRCA gene can be hypermethylated. And when it is hypermethylated, that's been associated with numerous cancers, including breast and ovarian, most famously, but also prostate and pancreatic cancer. And we know that this BRCA gene is also responsive to particular polyphenols like resveratrol or EGCG or curcumin or quercetin or genistein. And then what you've done, which is like fantastic, is then connected the dots even further and said like, okay, where do we get those polyphenols and adaptogens in our diet? And then this is where we have a tremendous amount of agency. So can you just like put your arms around all of that Um all of that data. Yeah, and let me just yeah. say it's so exciting. Like every forkful of food that we put in our mouths can have all of the aforementioned compounds. We should be eating every nutrients in every bite of food we take. That is like my central thesis, the, you know, now. We need mm-hmm. to be eating this information all of the time so that we're directing traffic in the best way possibly. So going back to Angelina Jolie, I mean she so she had her she has the BRCA mutation so that's actually damage to DNA that's damage to the har- hardware right. that's a mutation in the hardware um, that's different from the from epigenetics where we're hypermethylating it and inhibiting but as you pointed right. out they end up looking the same right you can have a hypermethylated BRCA gene so your gene itself is not damaged but it's inhibited it's been hypermethylated and shut down and yeah there's plenty of papers out showing hypermethylate, hypermethylation of the BRCA gene leads to all of the same hormone sensitive cancers and some other cancers that we see in a BRCA mutation. So they behave similarly. Um, I And so, and then you also go on to point out that there's nutrients, clear nutrients that we can consume that have been shown in animal studies and cell studies to liberate that BRCA mutation, that BRCA protein, excuse me, to liberate that and turn it back on so that it can protect us. I want to actually go back to your conversation around, you know, agent genetic agency and like whether we are a victim of these genetic mutations. And this is a little bit of a sidebar, but I think it's an incredibly important point. Sure. You know, in there's there's a really interesting study where they looked at um, they were able to associate over time the association of the BRCA mutation and the incidence of cancer. Um, and it was much, much, much less in the 40s and the 50s and 60s. So yeah. now, if you have the mutation, if that hardware is damaged, like Angelina Jolie, the likelihood you'll go on to develop cancer over your lifetime is something like 80 plus percent. I mean, it's incredibly high. So I agree. I think Angelina Jolie did the right thing. With the tools we have right now, her choices were correct. But there's right. no doubt that um, 
lifestyle influences how that uh, genetic mutation behaves and whether it ushers in a cancer or not. Yeah. Right. So we don't have any choice around a genetic mutation that we inherit at birth, but we do have some agency of whether or not that BRCA tumor suppressor gene gets hypermethylated or not. And essentially, yeah, what we want to do is create an unfriendly terrain for a cancer cell, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. And well, and we do have some agency if we have that mutation and we have no say over the DNA mutation, we've got agency of how well we, you know, whether or not that, you know, how likely that cancer is going to express it in, in us. So, so for right. both cases, we've got some choice. The thing with the mutation, though, is that we don't yet have the tools to be able to say conclusively our intervention will inhibit. We've got a lot of really strong ideas. If you leave, you know, live your cleanest, best, purest life, you're going to reduce the likelihood. In fact, the discover the woman who discovered the BRCA mutation, you know, suggested that it was increased rates of obesity, you know, uh, blood sugar dysregulation, diabetes, et cetera, early um, mm -hmm. early puberty, so precocious puberty, and it, it, all of mm -hmm. these things in girls were promoting this mutation to be more aggressive in, pro in causing cancer. Um, but then let me put a pin in that and get back to your point because yes, how we live will make a difference in whether that gene becomes hypermethylated or not. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, as you say, there are a lot of other factors, you know, how we eliminate estrogen, for example, which yes. can have be, um, involved in, in gut health and, and yes. there's a lot well, of in methylation elements. i mean the way that yeah. we actually interestingly enough as i said earlier that methylation is happening in all the cells of the body all the time we have hundreds of methylation enzymes just one of them is the dna methyltransferase that we're focusing on a right. major role of methylation is you know biotransformation of our estrogens into something that's healthy and benign right Okay, so we're trying to create an unfriendly terrain for disease. And so the, we know that if we activate these tumor suppressor genes, for example, that gives us a, a better chance of, of living a healthy and thriving life. And then we've established that these particular kind of tumor suppressor genes are um, nutrient sensitive. And then, and then we talked about specific um, nutrients uh, and micronutrients like polyphenols. So like quercetin, for example, quercetin sort of took a starring role over the, um, the, the tragedy known as COVID. Um, and um, now quercetin is a, is a, is a powerful um, polyphenol that you can find in a whole variety of different foods. But one of the key, like let's say apples, for example, you can find quercetin in apples. And you have a wonderful section in the book <laughs> that talks specifically about apples. Now, we, um, we, we generally consider um, in our minds like the, the idea of processing foods. We, we tend to kind of think of that as an industrial mechanism. And it like happens in a factory somewhere, but we can actually process foods at home even by just like peeling them or drying them or essentially not eating them as whole. So can you pull on that thread, for example, like if we want quercetin and there's every reason that we should, how do we eat our foods in order to maximize the possible intake of that nutrient? Yeah. So, you know, in the case of these beautiful polyphenols, we want to consume the food intact. We don't want to peel it, as you alluded to. It's the skin mm -hmm. that houses these gorgeous polyphenols. There is some in the fruit, you know, in the meat there itself, but really they're loaded up in the skin. So you don't want to get rid of them. If you cook apples, I think that's fair. You know, we want who doesn't want an apple pie from time to time? I mean, the, but the lighter that we cook them, sort of the, the, the lower heat, the slower cook that we engage in will retain those precious nutrients. 
So yeah, eat the whole plant, you know, as much as you possibly can. Don't get rid of any of it. Those nutrients are vital. Um, and if you're going to cook it, you know, low, slow. Yeah. So there's another um, nutrient responsive gene that you list here. And um, it's called glutathione S transferase, which is a, an enzyme, I assume, um, that speaks to glutathione. Now, I think that there's a lot of fluency around the nature of glutathione in general. People know it as an antioxidant. It neuters uh, reactive oxygen species and free radicals that can lead to oxidative stress. So we want to make sure that this particular enzyme or, or gene that codes for this enzyme is not, is not hypermethylated, yes. right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, well, it turns out, as, as you alluded to, cancer can definitely hijack all of these and turn them off. So what do we, what do we, what are some of the nutrients associated with making sure that we are endogenously creating enough glutathione? Hmm. Okay, that's a really good question. I, you know, glutathione is a tripeptide. There are three amino acids in glutathione, glycine, glutamate, and cysteine. Um, glutamate as a, a, an amino acid is ubiquitous. You know, it's just everywhere. We ingest plenty of it. But glycine's a little bit trickier, and so is cysteine. So for us to be able to make sufficient glutathione, we need to be eating protein, and we need to be making sure that we're getting those two. Um, we can synthesize to an extent some glycine. Um, and I want to point out that you, you know, gl glutathione is an important antioxidant. Uh, it also detoxes us from, you know, organo compounds. So you know, the, 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 the chemicals in the body like gly glyphosates, you know, plasticizers, the, the things that we're exposed to, glutathione plays a major role in detoxing. Metallo, uh, compounds, mm. mercury, lead, et cetera. Glutathione is a major lifter there. When we're detoxing using glutathione, we actually lose that glutathione. When we're using glutathione as an antioxidant, we can recycle it and use it again and again. If we have a heavy mm. toxic burden, we're spending glutathione. We're spending it and mm. we need to replete, replete it. So we, we, we need to be getting these amino acids in our body all the time. The way that we recycle glutathione is with vitamin C or alpha lipoic acid. We recycle using the other antioxidants in our body. Um, it'll help us reuse the glutathione that's there. In fact, there was one really kind of cool study that showed increased um, levels of glutathione just by taking vitamin C. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I, I just heard, this is a slight digression, but I, I just heard an interview with a woman named Stephanie Seneff, who's done a lot of work on glyphosate. Um, and she has a theory and of course, we, you know, a lot of these theories don't have all of the funding behind them to do all of the clinical research that we need. But an interesting theory that, you know, glyphosate, which is so prevalent, is so similar to the glycine molecule, is that it's actually replacing the glycine, mole the glycine molecule across a number of compounds and um, down-regulating our ability to actually create an antioxidant like, like glutathione, which I, I thought was pretty interesting. Um, you know, obviously there's a, there's a myriad other reasons to um, excoriate that particular um, herbicide. Um, so what about soy products? Because there's a lot of, um, I think, general confusion about soy. But when I was looking at you know, some of the nutrients that seem to be very essential in um, prohibiting or inhibiting the hypermethylation of these particular tumor suppressor genes. I kept coming back to genistein, and I, I always associate that with soy. So can you, can you untangle that for me? Well, you know what? The fact of the matter is, I mean, soy is pretty extraordinary. It's, you know, it's got these two potent epinutrients, genistine and equal. Um, how do I want to speak to this? And they, I mean, you'll see it listed time and again in that, in that um, table that it helps liberate, turn back on these hypermethylated compounds. 
we in the so in the intensive younger you that you know that I actually just got through teaching here at, at one commune um, we pull soy out um, soy is a common antigen uh, a lot of people are reactive to it it's one of the top you know 10 allergens in this country and other countries um, so we pull it out. There's also a lot of extremely compromised soy. I mean, going back to Stephanie Seneff, you know, soy is yeah. exposed to massive amounts of Roundup. I mean, there is it, when non-organic soy tends to be GMO, and it tends to be just laden in 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 problem pesticides. So we don't want to eat garden variety soy, but organic soy, fermented soy. There is a place for that in our diet. Those compounds are important. Um, we don't want to be necessary. We, we, we don't need to overconsume it. But I think it's worth respecting that there are some wildly important polyphenols that have some really great science behind them. And if we eat correct forms of soy, um, it's a healthful addition to our diet. I want to actually say one more thing. It's a little bit nuanced. It's fascinating. Um, Randy Jurdal and uh, his postdoc in his laboratory, Waterland, um, looked at, actually, I think there was another, I'm sorry, I can't remember the woman's name, who's the other postdoc who might have done this research with Jurdal, but it, Randy Jurdal is the, is, is, it was his laboratory. And they are looking at how nutrients given to pregnant mice affect offspring genetically. They're looking at epigenetic changes to the offspring. And they, yeah. they use the agouti mice. So these agouti mice are blonde. They're very visually just, you know, clear. They're blonde and they're obese. They don't look like your wild type brown house mice, house mouse. Um, and you can turn this, you, you can turn the agouti gene off by giving folate B12. You can give the methyl donors that I talked about earlier. You can turn it off. But one of the amazing things that they showed was that genistein did the same thing. Genistine mm. has nothing to do with the methylation cycle, but it acted in this animal model when given to pregnant dams, it acted like a methyl donor. Genistine acted like folate and B12. I mean, they speculate why that might be. Did it just move the DNA so that it could be, um, you know, methylated more readily? I mean, I don't think that that answer has, has been found yet, but in adults, so in the in the in the nutrient responsive genes you're talking about, genistein is inhibiting the lollipops, you know, methylation from happening. In adults, yet in utero exposure, genistein is acting in the exact opposite way and in promoting methylation, at least in an animal model. Hmm. So it's acting exactly, you know, depending on the life stage, it's it's behaving wildly different. They said in their study, and I talk about this actually in Younger You quite a bit, that we need to be mindful, therefore, about consuming lots of soy. So a pregnant woman, a, a pregnant vegetarian woman, I've seen this in my practice certainly plenty of times, are le frequently leaning on soy as a protein source, you know, and probably also taking folate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that isn't a good idea. They could be they could be creating a negative environment. Um, so we need to be aware of the impact of these nutrients. But again, I think some soy is fine if we can tolerate it, and and we definitely want to uh, only consume organic, ideally, you know, non-GMO, and even better would be fermented forms. Um, but it's a potent nutrient that we need to respect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's two different nuanced definitions of epigenetics, at least in my mind. One is that um, there's this layer uh, above our genome that is responsive to its environment that can turn on and off different kinds of gene expression. So that's one. Then there's this other meaning that it has for a lot of people that these that points to something connected but slightly different, which is 
that acquired traits uh, are transgenerationally passed down. And so I've always kind of wanted to try to under to connect those two ideas. And um, and so I, I'll ask you this as as very much a lay person is essentially that um, gene expression is changing partially due to this process of methylation. And these methylation patterns are then connected to the gene in a particular way that they're actually getting passed down transgenerationally. Is that yeah. really what's happening? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. That Yes, that, that's absolutely what's happening. I mean, you can think of it as, you know, generations of cells in the body. I mean, the, one of the wonderments of DNA mm. methylation is, and one of the reasons it's so well studied um, and considered to be such an important epigenetic mark is that there are, there's a family of these DNA methyltransferase enzymes, and one of them will actually preserve the methylation marks when a cell is dividing. So a new strand of DNA is being made in that process, and there's a DNA methyltransferase enzyme hanging right out there while that DNA is being made and laying those red lollipops on faithfully. And so if you think about in your own body, cell division after cell division after cell division, generation after generation, these marks can be maintained via this mechanism. Mm. Um, this is also the window that we can change, that we can start to lay down good marks and actually, you know, so we can talk about that as well. But thinking about transgenerational, um, vertical, so this is from, you know, generation one to a whole new generation to offspring um, versus horizontal when it's our own cell division. I uh, recall in the beginning of this conversation, I talked about en embryogenesis. Embryogenesis is happening and the first thing is that these there's demethylation enzymes. There's a family of these active demethylation enzymes that go in and clean out the methylation marks from mom and dad and, and then you know lay down fresh ones. But there's about 30% remaining. It's been estimated that 30% of your epigenome is handed off to your kids. <laughs> it's kind of amazing. So that information that you've created over a lifetime, some of that stays and is handed down to yeah. offspring. And it actually can 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 precede you as well, you know, and come from you know previous generations. So this is the transgenerational epigenetic inheritance phenomena that we see. Yeah, and it also imbues one with an additional sense of responsibility because you're not just eating for your own health, you're eating for your future progeny's health. And not just eating, but you know, exercising, sleeping, engaging in de-stressing modalities, trying to avoid environmental toxins, kind of et cetera. And, and, uh, and know, there's evidence. I, I, I just want to say. A lot of people. Were, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say there's evidence for that, which is extraordinary. I mean, this is passed through the generations. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I think a lot of people are, are familiar with some of the studies that happened on um, the generation um, uh, of people whose parents um, endured the horrors of the Holocaust and um, and there was some of that transgenerational trauma was passed on to future generations. Now, I'm not sure we actually understood the mechanism by which that trauma was passed on, but I think also in your book, you talk about um, a particular ice storm that happened in Quebec or, or Montreal, um, and, and Gabor Mate, I believe, also refers to this particular thing where you know, there was this very, very severe ice storm and um, very, very difficult circumstances where people lost power and um, there was no heat, et cetera, and it created a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety. And then they studied um, pregnant women and their offspring and their offspring um, that whose mothers had endured that time um, had disproportionate rates of asthma. I think was one of the conditions. And so 
we start to see this picture painted around the uh, the transgenerational passing on of, of acquired circumstances or acquired traits. But now I think what you're kind of starting to actually point to is the mechanism for that. So we i can i can grok it when it's food because i there's biochemistry there you're like okay methyl donors come in and it's like a lollipop with a carbon and some hydrogens and i understand how all of that stuff you know gets exchanged at a molecular level but when it comes to things like trauma you know is trauma like drinking a big gulp and I'm sort of, I don't mean to make fun of that really, but is trauma equivalent to like an environmental toxin that can essentially cause hypermethylation of like a tumor suppressor gene or something? Yeah, 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 you got it. That's exactly right. And I want to point out in Project Ice Storm, and I'll color in what you said and why it's like a big call, but Project yeah. Ice Storm, there wasn't a difference between actual physical stress and emotional stress. Those two stress mm. types influenced offspring the same. That This whole phenomena is termed biological embedding, which is the translation of psychic experience into biochemistry, to your point. Um, wow. Psychic experience yeah. is translated into uh, changes to DNA methylation, that's right, and, and, and gene expression. When we look at um, other offspring of trauma. So when we go back to the Holocaust survivors or when we look at offspring of survivors from the World Trade Center um, and other populations that have in experienced profound stress, maybe PTSD, you know, war, gener you know, generational war. Um, there's changes to DNA, so there's this biological embedding phenomena that's happening and it, um, alters the behavior of stress-associated genes. So genes, genes that are influenced by cortisol, glucocorticoids. And mm. this increased vulnerability to all of the chronic diseases of aging. And so this is to your big gulp point. We see higher rates of obesity, higher rates of diabetes, higher rates of cardiovascular disease coming from this previous generation uh, trauma that is then biologically embedded in offspring. And so this is, this is how the stress response can be tran translated. You can also see increased rates of anxiety, of uh, other kinds of mental illness, depression, maybe even schizophrenia, and I'm thinking about one population. Um, but you also see this inflammatory response, you know, driving conditions that aren't that different from following the standard American diet, which you were implying with your, with your big gulp analogy. Yeah, yes. And we can see this generationally. Man. Mm -hmm. It's it's so intense, really, Kara, because um, like when you think of a petri dish, okay, that has a biological medium, and you put a a breast cell or a bacterial cell in there, and you know, and you create a healthy bacterial medium, which is known as a culture. Um, that particular cell is going to thrive and it's going to grow and it's going to replicate. Um, and then to, to take this analogy or to create a metaphor here, it's like if you put a human being in a, in a, um, in a social medium that's healthy, that's full of nutritious food, uh, a toxic-free environment, um, love, connection, community, movement, restoration, um, you are going to produce a healthy human, more, more than likely. But if you essentially create a caustic and toxic environment or a toxic culture um, with, you know, pesticides and herbicides and BPAs and phthalates and parabens and refined foods and processed foods and refined sugars and refined grains and on and alcohol and on and on, it... it we can't expect anything except dysfunction. Except we can't expect anything except you know mental illness and addiction and and um, and neurodegenerative diseases and things. So it's it's and 
and now we're understanding that that it's not just something that that exists sort of out there this is actually creating physiological changes within our human organism that then are making us actually sick um and and it's just a it's like i feel like you're just kind of at the tip of the spear with actually understanding all of this and that's the first step we have to understand it before then we can start to get our, our hands around you know how, how do we make uh, a world that our, our hearts know is possible so it's it just kind of blows me away to be honest what you're doing and I'm, I'm thinking about it too in the context of my daughter um who you know just she just moved to another continent um uh, as an 18 year old after uh you know 18 years in loving residence and you know, I want to be healthy for her um, because uh, I, I, I actually, I want to feel good for myself, but I also don't want to be 70 years old and be a burden on her and a burden on society. Um, so there are just so many reasons uh, I think for us to take a very, very hard look at the choices that we're making every single day and, and what kind of ripple effect that has. Yeah. And it's more than just what we're eating, although to your point, eating is essential. It's how we're living and how we're being. And, you know, the other piece I think is important is many of us will recall stressful childhoods, or we know that our parents went through stress, or, you know, most of us, or many of us in this country, it came from other countries. You know, we we, we did, unless we're Native American, mm -hmm. or, you know, and we, we came here likely because of some hardship. I mean, I wrote about it in my book. I think uh, my family was in Poland, and there were, there were some deficits during that time. There were some challenges that brought them to the United States. I think that there was a, a lack of food, although I don't think that they were, they were starving, but opportunity was, was scant. Look at African Americans who came here as slaves. I mean, we, we have, all of us in our history, or Native Americans and what they went through, we, we have trauma in our history that has no doubt influenced, that has no doubt prompted biological embedding of a challenging kind in all of us. You know, and there's that saying, which I'm gonna get wrong, but like, you know, the, the, the quote of, you don't know what's going on in somebody's life, and so be kind, you know, because we don't know their story. All of us have probably ch some element of challenging biochemistry, some challenging biological embedding. And I think about how we need to go easier on ourselves. A lot of times what this means is that our stress response, we can have a low threshold for stress. We experience it perhaps you know, more readily than we might think we should. You know, this thing really profoundly stressed me out, but it wasn't a big deal. And maybe we're mad at ourselves because we were so reactive. I mean, we don't know what's happening on our epigenome. We don't know what we, we learned either in our life experience, especially early on, or what we inherited, what was going on with mom when she was pregnant with us, or what was happening, you know, in prior generations. So, there's some sort of a kindness, I think, that is essential that we give, that we extend to ourselves, and we also do our best to extend it to others because of this phenomena. I, and I want to talk, Jeff, too, at least I, I want to hear what you, you want to say about that because it's so powerful. We haven't studied resilience as well as we should. I mean, we need to focus on what resilience looks like. What does survival look like? What does thriving look like in the epigenome? And how do we foster that? That's a, um, an area of wildly important science. Um, likely all of us have some evidence of resilience and survival as well. We just need to start nailing it down. And my mentor and colleague and co-author on the paper, he was an advisor on our study, Dr. Moshe, Moshe Seff, has, 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 is looking at this. So he's looking at, he was part of Project Ice Storm. He was part of, he's been an epic probably the longest epigeneticist actually really in the world. He's been an epigeneticist since the 80s. Um, he has looked at Holocaust survivors and he's looked at the fallout of um, orphanage, you know, of, of, of children of orphanages and how that influences epigenetics. And he's continues to be positive that we'll be able to identify those 
biological embedding, those faulty um, changes to the methylome that set us up for later struggles, be them psychiatric or um, uh, in, the, in the realm of physiologic diseases, the chronic diseases of aging, and that we'll be able to correct them before they even show up, before they're even an issue. So he believes mm. that we'll be able to actually go in and shift epigenetics simply, even in a fetus, you know, of a mom who's experienced who was in Project Ice Storm. And not with mm. aggressive drugs. There's demethylating drugs. There are aggressive um, in, in, in chemotherapy. You know, there's some pretty intense drugs out there that will change epigenetic expression and we use them in cancer. But with simple interventions, I mean, he published last year a PTSD mouse study where they were able to turn around the epigenome in this in, in the central nervous system of these of these mice using vitamin A and S adenosylmethionine, that methyl donor molecule. They corrected the epigenetic biological embedding of PTSD and concurrently resolved the um, physical, the behavioral evidence of that PTSD using two really safe molecules. I think it's extraordinary. I mean, he's got a, for the, for the level of work that he's done, I mean, he's looked at the most difficult, you know, studying Holocaust survivors and orphanages and so forth. And he still has this positive belief that we're going to crack this nut and figure it out and minimize and omit, eliminate suffering, which I just think is so mm -hmm. remarkable and just so positive. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's a pretty amazing human. Yeah, particularly eliminating unnecessary suffering. I mean, it's it's interesting because it seems like there's this tightrope to walk between stress and distress. Um, because a lot of um, folks right now are talking about, for example, adversity mimetics or hormesis, um, essentially purposefully um, uh, adopting certain protocols that produce a, that confer a positive physiological response to short-term stressors. And um, so that could be high interval training or uh, intermittent fasting or calorie restriction or well, cold even these, hydrotherapy. Even these polyphenols that we're talking about that influence gene expression, they're, they're, they're considered xenohormetics in some cases. So we're, we're, we're not talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Those are no, important, we're not talking about yeah. that. We're not talking about, although it is interesting because, you know, um, Dr. Jeff Bland, who, who I know is influential on you, you know, he, he introduced me to this uh, Himalayan tartary buckwheat and uh, it's awesome. I've actually started to sneak it into my kids' uh, pancakes here and there. I got to mix the flowers though. I mean, they're not full tartary buckwheat yet, but, um, but, uh, it, you know, if you look at, um, if kind of going back to the idea of stoicism in plants or resilience, um, you know, over millennia, this particular plant um, acquired its polyphenol content through essentially adversity because it grew in a very, very difficult place to grow in the Himalayas. And if you look, you know, uh, at some of these studies around the blue zones, for example, you know, some of the plants that are growing in the hillier regions of like Sardinia, for example, they're very, very rich in polyphenols. And then the goats are eating those particular plants and, you know, all of, and those essentially those adaptive protective me um, mechanisms that are being generated in the plants are then getting passed along to the goats that are eating the plants or the people that are eating the plants directly, which is just kind of fascinating. And, and these things are evolving over millennia. But obviously, I, you know, I think that there is this delineation between what like good stress or what the Greeks called eustress and then trauma, um, which which seems to have obviously a very deleterious impact um, on your epigenome. Yeah. So, yeah, like Himalayan tartary buckwheat. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> yeah. um, it survives and thrives. I mean, it thrives. I mean, that's the difference. When we look at some of the toxic stress that's handed down, 
we see it show up in the chronic diseases of aging. I mean, we see a certain, you know, we see a real compromised human at the end of the day. Um, however, let me just go back to the point that there's a resilience pattern that we've got to understand. And that's been, that's been argued in the scientific literature that there's a sort of a, there's a, there's a excessive, a, an undue attachment to studying, you know, pathological trauma and not understanding like post-traumatic resilience. What does that look like? You know, what is, what does that look like epigenetically? What is that, you know, that individual presenting to us who's come through the fire and they're psychically intact? You know, what does their epigenome look like? Those are the folks we need to be studying. You know, we need to be looking and because we because we have an idea of the genes that get that get turned on and off. They call it differential methylation patterns in 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 mm. these trauma um, subjects. And so, you know, we could look at those same genes in people who are thriving on the other side of trauma and or or the people who didn't develop PTSD and were in the same experience. I mean, the most of us actually don't go on to develop PTSD. It's always the minority who do. And so what does that look like? Yeah, I think it's so interesting. In the same way that you could study a human that um, might have like the BRCA mutation, but actually didn't develop cancer. Well, what is it about their particular terrain that essentially got them to defy the odds? So at the same kind of connected to that thought is how do some people experience what is known as post-traumatic growth after some kind of a trauma-inducing event? And, um, and I think there would be, you know, there's a lot of value in, in that kind of study. No, oh, 100%. One of the things that I'm very interested in, so going back to our conversation on nutrient responsive genes, um, the mm -hmm. literature right there is on tumor suppressors. That's where the, that's where the, the, the literature is. And, and it's interesting, tumor suppressor genes have multiple roles. So as you pointed out, glutathione S-transferase is an antioxidant. It's do, that enzyme is doing all sorts of important things and it's protecting us from cancer because it does all these really important things. But the literature on how nutrients influence genes is primarily limited to tumor suppressors. I have, um, I've been working at developing a a, a test looking at um, 6,000 different methylation sites in genes associated with not just tumor suppressors, because I'm very interested in studying how our diet and other things influence those, but also these genes that get hypermethylated or differentially methylated in some of these biological embedding experiences. So we have those, like, I'm very interested, oxytocin, for example, the mm. love hormone is hypermethylated and inhibited in certain traumas. Um, it's associated with depression, and we can see it inhibited in, in, in um, postpartum depression, um, OCD, uh, uh, PTSD. I mean, we can see oxytocin receptor changes due to methylation. Um, those mm. glucocorticoid genes that I was talking about that we can see change from trauma, I'm looking at those as well. I'm, I, I want to see how much because I suspect that if we adhere to an epinutrient dense uh, pattern of eating, combined with the lifestyle factors that we know profoundly influence gene expression, like exercise acts like a vegetable as far as the epigenome is concerned. I mean, it really does. So if we're adhering to these, if we're sleeping enough. How are we changing our methylation burden on these other important genes? So that's a, an area of investigation that, you know, is, is, is in my future. Yeah. I keep seeing you with a t-shirt that says exercise is a vegetable. Um, maybe, <laughs> yeah, I love maybe it. Maybe that could be a, that could be a side <laughs> hustle for us, maybe. <laughs> yeah, do uh, it. Oh my God, that's so funny. It's true. It acts like a vegetable when it comes to the epigenome. I mean, it's really, it's like, if, all right, you don't want to do kale, you know, drop and give me 20 or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that, that would be amazing if you became up, came up with some equations that way. It'd be like, okay, you got two cups of kale or 20 push-ups, you, you know, pick your, Go. <laughs> pick your epi, epi nutrient. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I want to give... Uh, you know, people 
um, a few of the uh, epinutrient superstars. Um, and I'm always hesitant to recommend superfoods because superfoods tends to imply that all you need to eat is this one thing and you'll be good. So I try to not do that. But there are there is a family, a pantheon, let's say, of superstars. So um, maybe you could uh, bullet point a, a few of those for the listeners. And I'll say the my favorite section of the book is the nutrient. Actually, I, I like a lot of the book. I mean, we worked on this long and hard. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you still so like it I because did. sometimes I look back at the things that my the fossil you records that I've lot. produced, and I'm like, ah. I, there's so, I cringe, it's but ridiculously uh, impressive. You're, you're, I can't. I mean, yeah. you have been prolific. It's amazing. Um, our nutrient appendix is 30 pages. This is a nutrient appendix of specifically epinutrients. And so, I want to say to anybody who might be anxious about what this protocol is, there are foods that you're already eating. You know, unless you're subsisting on a fast food garbage diet, you're eating, you're getting epinutrients in your body, probably, probably really at most meals. And I would just argue we want you know, virtually every fork fall packed and it's, and it's doable. Um, our favorites, you know, we call them the dynamic dozen. And to your point, Jeff, flip open the appendix, look at what other ones you don't have to be a beholden to, to our list, um, is of course, green tea. No great surprise there. Yes. Turmeric made the, made the list. Blueberries are right there. Um, but it could be any berry. I mean, arguably black, but blackberries or, you know, wild blueberries, maybe, uh, you know, more important, um, salmon. So DHA and just the fatty fish, um, pumpkin seeds are, are on our list. Greens. I think we pop spinach on the list, but, uh, you know, it could be any dark leafy is going to be a big player. What else do I have? Shiitake made the list. I love mm. mushrooms are crazy superfoods in the epig epigenetic region, but it doesn't have to be limited to shiitake. Maitake, inoki, even button mushrooms have their place. But those are just some yeah. of the ones that are fabulous. Oh, liver. Yeah, Actually, I, I, let me let me say liver. Let's get that out. And I know. Let's get that out of the way because <laughs> that kept showing up on the right hand column, you know, next to every single uh, uh, methyl donor. And I was like, oh, man, do I really have to eat liver? Um, <laughs> but uh i mean i think these are the things that you know one can experiment with and um and and learn to love i mean i am slowly um implicating mushrooms into the family diet here so i have three daughters uh you know they're apt to anytime dad walks in the kitchen they're apt to say ew gross get out of here don't you know don't make me anything except a grilled cheese and um and I'm like, no, no, no. And uh, I think, you know, we got to, I think I actually fooled them about two weeks ago that this uh, a marinated mushroom was actually a steak. It tasted so meaty and good. And so, you know, I've had to really, I mean, I love some mushrooms. I love them kind of sort of sauteed with 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 garlic and, you know, a little bit of olive oil or, uh, or even avocado oil and just some salt and pepper and that's good that's good enough um but um but i think mushrooms is something they're they're so adaptable and um and they can really be something that i think you're you, you can even if you're don't have an intuition to like them you can learn to like them and they've got so much to offer from a from much a i mean they're extraordinary they've got folate they've got choline like eggs i mean if you're a vegan and you're not going to eat eggs you need to be definitely loving on mushrooms the cool thing about mushrooms and liver like i'm not a huge liver lover i'll go for a, a nicely made pate but that's the exception, you can get it in capsules. So if you're not vegetarian or vegan and you're willing to at least consider liver, you can take it in capsules. Um, you can get very, there's lots of options out to get clean source capsules. And you know what, there is, there are some mush, mushroom companies. There are some companies making fabulous high quality uh, mushroom products in caps. And so I lean on that when I'm, I actually always have some 
ca encapsulated mushroom combinations around for when I don't feel like I'm getting enough because they're, they're that important. And if we're not going to bring them in our diet on a consistent basis, you know, I'll pop some in my mouth in a supplement form. Yeah. And, and I think for the urban dwellers um, who, you know, don't have uh, any arable land, you probably have a balcony or a windowsill where you can grow some fresh herbs and herbs can be the best adaptogens and you, you you can just sprinkle them on things and you're also just growing them right there so you can watch it so it's so gratifying um so you know i noticed like you have oregano parsley peppermint rosemary you know these things are these herbs that are incredibly adaptable and then they, they also serve to be these very potent adaptogens as you know you outlined earlier they help essentially these methyl donors be more effective. Yes, so, go where they need to go so that you're not turning yeah. off a tumor suppressor gene, you're turning off a pro-inflammatory gene. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I think all of those you just mentioned have rosmarinic acid, which is a top nutrient, you know, is a top uh, compound to obtain. It's a, just a top all important um, methylation adaptogen, yeah. You know the cool thing about herbs too, my daughter loves to, she won't, she won't go near an herb if it's in food, but for some reason she sure loves to pick them and pop them in her mouth. I mean, I don't know, that brings her a lot of joy. So yeah, yeah. that's how she gets her <laughs> rosemary. <laughs> well, she'll be a modern day forager. Yeah. Um, oh, she is. No doubt. Yeah. That, well, that's a good instinct to, uh, to encourage. Um, what, what do you think about, um, supplementing with things like ashwagandha, rhodiola, these other kinds of adaptogens that are often come in tincture form or, you know, you can take them sublingually. So I am, I'm a, I'm a fan when, when we need them, when it's hard to get them elsewhere. I think rhodiola is brilliant. I think the science out of Russia, you know, conducted so many years ago on, you know, on the, 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 the resiliency, the promoting properties of rhodiola are, it's, it's awesome. Uh, likewise, you know, ashwagandha, you know, another incredibly smart, long used herb um, in tincture form, in tincture form. So, yeah, there, there's definitely a place for supplementing with those. Um, you know, what's the duration? What's the appropriate duration? There's some consideration that we don't want to go long term. We, might, we probably want to pulse rotate through. I mean, there's many of these beautiful polyphenol compounds that uh, we can rotate through if we tend to supplement. Um, my thinking is that we'll be t looking at what's happening epigenetically more and more, that the price point on the testing will come down. It'll probably be easier. Maybe we won't need invasive specimen like blood. Maybe we'll be able to do them with saliva. I mean, my hope is that at some point in the not so distant future, our wearables will house information or be able to somehow tell us if something's, you know, negatively influencing our biological age, you know, which we measure epigenetically or positively, um, and that we'll be able to make these decisions kind of in real time. Right now, we, we, I think we, I think it's fair to, to use these products as we think that they're indicated or as our, you know, health provider um, prescribes them to us, um, but maybe rotate through. And if you're open to doing epigenetic testing, look and see how it influences your biological age. Yeah. I, I really love your approach to, I don't even want to use the word biohacking because that's really not what it is. And that carries with it this, uh, it, it's sort of redolent of a mortality and, and escape velocity and all these ideas that like uh, somehow we're going to live forever. Um, you know, you're into the Nora ring, you know, you, I think you still wear a continuous glucose monitor, you know, so do I, you know, I'm very enthused by this notion of like, could there be a, a wearable that could reflect our, our bio age by measuring all these kind of methylation markers. And then we could have, a glimpse kind of moment to moment into how our particular behaviors impact those particular markers. And in a way we become the CEO of our own healthcare in that particular um, environment. And, and, you know, there's this notion of precision individualized medicine, 
Um, but wouldn't it be great if we didn't need necessarily to go to the doctor or have to have a doctor analyze every single thing um, in order to actually make really good decisions about our own lives? And one of the things that I love about your approach is that, you know, you're thinking about it really not just about in this own kind of Silicon Valley infused, I'm going to live forever kind of way. <laughs> um, you, you know, what I want my life to be is I want to be healthy pretty much all the way to the end and then just drop off. <laughs> and that's the way not everybody, but a lot of people used to live, you know, at the beginning of, you know, the 20th century for example, where we only live to, you know, 46, 47 in the United States. Um, but we didn't have this, you know, 16 to 20 years of limping along, getting progressively more and more ill and really not living a very fulfilling life, but also one that's so burdensome on the people around us. And, um, you know, we've really changed the way that we look at at the elderly and it's um you know we created we often say that you know we're created in god's image i think we actually created god in our own image <laughs> where we you know we made him this wizened old man with a beard and a robe because we used to look to our elders as these founts of wisdom and experience. And now we look at them as like, oh my God, you know, like what a burden. Sometimes I think if we created a modern God, you know, would he look like David Sinclair <laughs> or something, you know, or Mark Zuckerberg or whatever, you know, would they be, would he, you know, because these are the kinds of folks that we coronate or sanctify now in, in our, in our modern uh, society. And, we just have so much to learn from our elders and it would be so wonderful to change our cultural perspective um, by, uh, of our elders by lengthening health span and not just lifespan. I think you've just spoken so, you've, you've written so eloquently about that. 100%. Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. So yeah, we, we lived we had a more robust health span 100 plus years ago. And then, you know, an infectious disease would knock us off. And now we deteriorate quickly. I know I give the statistic of 16 years, but, you know, well before our 60s, we're seeing in kids the chronic diseases of aging. I mean, we're seeing diabetes show up. I mean, God, there was, you know, there was a 77% increase in type 2 diabetes in kids during COVID. I mean, God. that is an insane what? statistic insane, insane, just a meteoric rise in, you know, the, the, what happened to the world here, you know, in the United States with regard to, you know, diabetes and the, in the shutdown that was COVID. Yeah. It's extraordinary, extraordinary. Yeah. And so kids, you know, younger and younger and younger, we're getting the diseases of aging. So, you know, I think this final 16 years that were compromised is, is just going to extend. I mean, if we, it is extending, you know, it is. And those diseases of aging are aging themselves. They're, they're aging, they're pro-aging in themselves. It's this vicious cycle. So aging turns up the volume on our vul vulnerability to those diseases. Um, but then when we have those diseases, we are then aging in a faster rate and one disease begets another disease. I mean, it's a real slippery slope until we make a very intentional, conscious, um, intervention and change the trajectory of our lives. And that's our yeah. choice. You know, that's really our choice. Yeah, I absolutely. Well, I've started to think of health as synonymous with happiness, really. Happiness is sort of an ineffable concept. It's hard to get our hands around it. But when you look at the core elements of what makes someone happy, it's really what also makes someone healthy. And if you, you know, you don't have to look far to see how much unhappiness there is right now. And that's reflected in, in our public discourse. 
Um, it's re reflected in our politics. I mean, we could categorize or characterize our society as one that is suffering from inflammation. And that is a direct reflection of what is happening in our own personal physiology. Um, and so this is why, you know, I think your work uh, is just so, so important. And, you know, you can certainly count on me as, a, as, um, as an ally and in, in a supporter. Uh, because I think, like I said, you're right at the tip of the spear of actually explicating the mechanisms of how this stuff works. And once I think, you know, we understand the mechanisms, then we can adopt the protocols. So you're really doing a great job laying out the mechanisms and then saying like, okay, now you understand this. Now you can adopt these particular protocols to address that. And um, yeah, I'm just super grateful for, for your work. Well, I am really grateful for you. I mean, I just have to say it's been a pleasure. I'm so glad that you reached out to me. Was it Nick Ortner who introduced us? And I'm so glad that we made that connection. It's been a blast being here at One Commune. I mean, all of these perfect Younger You meals. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, it's right. been so fun to be here. And um, the community here, the energy, it's special. I mean, what you've created is, it's so special. I mean, it really is. And I, I'm grateful well, to, you know, have gotten to join it. Well, fantastic. fantastic. Well, well, I hope we, we can brainstorm, brainstorm some, some, some more projects, projects yes. together, <laughs> uh, some retreats, oh, some cool. getaways. Um, I know, I know that, that we could do a fantastic, fantastic retreat, retreat up in Topanga. So I'll, I'll mm. plant that mm -hmm. seed. <laughs> um, and uh, um, obviously we've, we've just uh, shot this course and yeah, thank you for trusting us and for coming out to a place in the hills with no internet called commune, <laughs> so, <laughs> which can be a little risky, but I swear for anyone listening, nobody's naked, nobody's dropping acid, um, <laughs> at least uh, publicly. So, um, <laughs> it's so fun it's anyway. beautiful it's pristine i just have a lot of gratitude that i got to have this experience so yeah i'm thrilled awesome. to be able to launch the younger you method to your you know to your your folks yeah awesome can you tell us just uh, in closing where people can stay abreast of your work and maybe talk just a little bit about your app and obviously we'll put all of this in the show notes uh, including your book, but I, I just want to make sure that people have that opportunity to hear it from you. Awesome. I'm so glad that you're asking me. We actually have another book coming out. We in, uh, we have a book launched in November called um, Better Broths and Healing Tonics. So this is how you can drink your epi nutrients. It's such a cool book. I know there's an, you know, I've got an extraordinary team um, and we were able to bust this out and it's, yeah, it's a great book. And so we'll talk about that. It would be awesome to actually have some of these recipes created here um, if we did a retreat. So Better Broths and Healing Tonics is out November 8th. Um, drink Your Epi Nutrients and so much more. There's just, it's such a beautiful book. People can reach me at, the easiest place to reach me is um, youngeryouprogram.com. And my, just the rest of everything I'm doing, my podcast, blogs, et cetera, at drkarafitzgerald.com. So Younger You Program, and both link to each other. So if you only remember Younger You Program, go there, sign up for a newsletter. We'll just keep you apprised of everything. You can do, you can connect with our physicians and do a very individualized Younger You Program. We've got nutrition groups going on where you can do a community version of the Younger You, um, a virtual community, and then, or if you want to just grab the app and, and just do it yourself. Um, that's an option. So we'll walk you through all that if, at Younger You Program. Fantastic. Well, I'll only let you go if you agree to to be <laughs> continued. Totally. I, as you can see, if anyone can see my desk, they see it has about 30 pages of notes of which I've gotten <laughs> to maybe about one page. So there's <laughs> so, so much cool. to talk about. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and so... Uh, Thank you so much, Dr. Kara Fitzgerald, to, to be continued. Thank you. Great to be here with you, Jeff. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this interview from the Commune Podcast, then click subscribe and check out this video right here.